That's a lot of lighthouses. How's everybody doing? Welcome in here, gatekeepers. I had to double check to see if my mic is on. Is this thing working? Are we good? Hello, welcome in. Welcome in, everybody in here. I see a lot of new names, so, you know, feel to home, as they say. Pull up a chair, get a good seat. Um, these are the gatekeepers. They're wonderful. These mods are wonderful. Um, this chat is fantastic. And um, if you haven't subscri subscribed or if you haven't given a thumbs up, please do. Um, it helps us get out there and it helps uh, us get to the people who need to hear whatever it is we're saying. It might be one little sentence that helps them through their day or gives them encouragement or some hope or, you know, validates uh, an experience that they had or something else. You know, it's not just ghost stories. It's not just tales and you know, legends and things like that it's actual i think learning from the dead actually helps you live better so pass it along welcome in here i see ted and i always feel like i need that that thing i see ted and scott and, um gosh i don't so sweetie i don't know what to call you. i'm gonna call you rp if that's cool is that cool because look we had somebody in here i called them pancakes because i just can't even you know, that's a lot of letters. Um, so welcome, welcome. And everybody else I saw in here, Jack, hi, honey, how you doing? Welcome, I saw, hey, Echo, how you doing? Um, I saw uh, Vixen Doe, I want to make sure that she's getting that uh, email out to Lynn so she can get her book. I always get nervous until some, everybody says they got theirs because, uh, you know, I don't have anything to do with the other side. And Lynn's been asking me, so I want to make sure. That um, if you see Vixen in another chat or whatever, double check that she got uh, in touch with Lynn. Thank you very much. Hey, Glenn, how you doing? Good, good, good. Good to see you. I have to get real close sometimes to see these names. I'm sorry. I'm getting old. Here it is. And it's such a big screen. It's just the way the light is and everything else and the light's bouncing. So much going on. So lighthouses, yeah. Um, sorry I was a little late. I didn't get to do... Uh, the regular, you know, long intro, but I wanted to get that in with uh, lighthouses because, look, man, that's a lot around the globe, and you know, we don't, we're not just talking about USA, and of course, it's easier for us to get information on that. And people, I, uh, you know, I can go around. I can see the one at Barnegat's not very far from me, and there's, you know, a lot of people here really pay attention to uh, lighthouses. You see it a lot. I'm on the shore. So you see a lot of that, you know, the sweaters, the lighthouses and stuff like that. It's nautical, you know. But other than that, I've always been drawn to the lighthouses because of that eeriness and that what is it about lighthouses to you guys? Hey, Monica, welcome in, honey. Um, to you guys that gives you that eerie feeling. Is it the fact that you're out there in the middle of the, you know, in some cases out in the middle of the, the water there, um, out you know, past the breakers, you've got all these waves hitting you and the storms. Um, in some cases, you're on an island, you know, completely cut off from shore. Now, not all of them are like that, but I know, you know, of course, to be functional, they would have to be close to the, <laughs> close to the edge. But um, just a creepy kind of lonely, um, I think it has some kind of a stigma to it, especially in the older days when it must have been so rough. And um, I've never seen a good movie that made it look look good. Let's get Steve in here and see what he thinks about it. But while I'm getting Steve in here, what do you guys think about it? Are they eerie? Are they relaxing? You think they're relaxing? Could you, Scott, could you go out there in the middle of a, on an island and just be, you know, storms and all, storms and all? That's the part that would get me. That one picture that I showed during that with that whole wave was just hitting up in the, the back of that lighthouse. Just, you know, says chills up your spine. Hey, hanging. How you doing? So let's get Steve in here. Your thumbs up, Steve. Are you good? He's ready to roll. Come on in here, you old brown snake. Hey, hey, what's going on? Can you hear me all right? You sound wonderful. You sound wonderful. So what do you think about the lighthouses? Are they? Um, they're creepy. <laughs> they're, they're, they're peaceful to look at at a distance, but when you get up there and you go up in them and, and look out, if you get up on the walk up there, and it's just, I don't know, there's just something strange about them. Even the, you know, the circular staircases. Yeah. You know, 
some of, they could be so beautiful and then you get in these others you know where you can get real excited about it then you go and find some old dilapidated one just stuff's peeling off the walls it's cold yeah. and clammy mm, did I you happen it. to see that movie which one with, uh, the name of it? well um it was a lighthouse it was not say in the past couple of years maybe i mean in the last five at least I, I didn't see it and it's william defoe and it was some kind of weird dark comic book well what do you call it? graphic novel a uh, lighthouse where something weird was going on it was very um hp lovecrafty there was something living in the lighthouse steve it was kind of like a octopus Kind of phantom oh, poltergeist, kind of a cracking Cthulhu type creature. That, uh, yeah, say that again. Cthulhu is that how they HP yeah. said it? It's hard, isn't it? I was trying when I was doing, we were doing HP Lovecraft, I was reading that, and everybody said, you know, this is how you say it. I still can't say it right, but that octopus thing that you know, that serpent, that sea creature, you know. And somebody in the chat was saying sirens and, you know, there was this whole thing with this movie. Did anybody see this movie? If you haven't, please don't. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to express that to you. Um, you'll never get the visuals out of your, out of your head. There we go. Well, now we got to go watch it. It's, oh, it's hideous. It's so hideous. It's like if, um, I don't know how to explain it, Steve. It's so, so dark. It's so dark. And um, very acid trippy, very, but in slow motion, if you can imagine. Hmm. I'll, I'll and check that out. Very psychotic. You're not sure what's going on. There's something weird going on with the seagulls. There's some kind of, you know, Moby Dick thing going on there. Um, it's very kind of Poe-ish. Um, I don't know. Maybe you should watch it, I, you know. It's it, it was just horrible. I don't know how else to. It made you maybe you feel dark. It made me feel like you know I need to take a shower and you know do something do maybe something that's positive. The last thing you want to do is get in the water. I, might I don't know, but it was hard. Did I anybody else see it? What was the name of it? Water elementals. That too. I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. What? I said, uh, yeah. If you get in the shower, whatever that is, might come through the shower head, and it's Cthulhu, so it can. Oh, does, did they come through the shower head? Did HP I, have I, a, I don't probably. I don't. We don't know that it's not it possible. Going to up out of the drain. Now that would sound better. You know, I'll tell you what. <laughs> if you're at a certain time, a certain time of the day, and you start thinking about snakes coming up through the toilet, it'll mess you up. Because there are such things, you know, in certain in certain places, they'll tell you, you know. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time a rat come up through one of those in, in New York in the, do you know what I'm saying? Found a couple of movies here. Uh, one from 2017 called cold skin. And then another one from 2019, just called the lighthouse. Now, I don't know which. I think that said, does that have Willem, Willem Dafoe in it? Well, which right out of the gate, you know, you're in for a treat, right? <clears throat> uh, yep. Yep. The lighthouse. Yep, 2019. Yep. That's it. We'll, we'll I can show that. some pictures from it because just the pictures are just absolutely. Uh, it just just looks creepy there. In the, but you see how it's very dark and very um, graphic novelly. Yeah, it's it's based on a, a Poe reinvisioning of Edgar Allan Poe's unfinished short funny? story of the same name, The Lighthouse. Well, how about that? See, I didn't even know it. It felt like a Poe. Isn't that weird? I did, yeah. I honestly didn't know. I didn't look. I didn't look into it beforehand. I saw William Defoe, and I thought, you know, he can do some crazy stuff, but he can also do some, you know, yep. obscure things. I've seen him in a dress and in hot red lipstick, and I'm here to tell you that's something you're not <laughs> going to forget quick. You know what I mean? You know, it's not something you want to see again. Uh, let me see if I can get some images and just to give you guys the overall feel for this. No wonder it, it felt like that, Steve. No joke. Because it really, boy, they hit it now on the head there. I, I've got to go watch it now. It's just so, um, okay, well, here's the, at least we can get you the, uh, I'm pushing buttons. I have to think about it. I think about it and I still mess up. Okay, here we go. Images. So there's the. Yeah, there you go. That just looks creepy. 
It does. Let's see what else we can get up here. We follow it in. Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Yep. Yep. Director is Robert Eggers, The Witch, and Hansel and Gretel. Well, that says a lot to me there. Mm -hmm. Starring, uh, yeah, Willem Dafoe. 2019. So, uh, but again, it's just got a very, well, it's supposed to feel dark. And I guess if that's what they were shooting for, um, but Sounds I had no like idea. They, sounds like they hit it. I had no idea. Now I wonder how much. Uh, I'm not familiar with the story uh, that they're talking about. Poe, are you? Yeah, no, it says an unfinished uh, Poe oh. short story. So I have to find that and read it too. Big fan of Poe. Well, I don't know. To, I don't know because uh, I'm starting to think now. Maybe they took a lot of uh, literary license. You know what I mean? I don't know mm -hmm. where they ran with it because. It's a long, I mean, it just keeps going and going and going and going. It's one of those movies that's just like, oh my gosh, you know, what's happening here? And it's, it's got a, it's almost got a thing, um, very similar to in Cabin 22 with, um, uh, 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 what's his name in the rat? Uh, it's my character. I can't even remember the names of, um, not Jeb, the other one. Uh, Skeeter Davis. Skeeter, yeah. Skeet. You know, it, it, at least that was fun. I mean, it was ugly, and it was dark, no doubt, but it was fun. It was kind of, you could kind of see what was going on there, but I have no clue what was going on in this thing, and it's just, it's ruined me for, you know. I, w I didn't even use any gifts in that thing. I didn't put any of the stuff in it because it just makes you feel awful. And I think they wound up going to this island, uh, Steve, with just like a, a, a burlap bag with stuff in it. And, you know, Willem, this wasn't his first uh, <clears throat> rodeo. So he was already a little mad, a little crazy, mm -hmm. you know. And then they get dropped on. And I think they're, you know, they don't see anybody else for like a year or something mess. You know, something like that. It sounds like a recipe for, you know, a fun year. Yeah. You know? Like 2020. Oh, gosh. Yeah, let's not repeat that one. <laughs> I, I have an idea. Twenty four is going to make twenty. You say, Hold my beer. <laughs> written, 20, 20, 2020 20 was written by Stephen King, directed by Quentin Tarantino, and the soundtrack by Yoko Ono. Oh darn! If that isn't close to it, <laughs> Skeeter, Skeeter Davis. Yep, yep. You've heard you Echo. You've heard twenty two. You were in here with listen one Halloween, weren't you? It, forgive me for if I don't remember correctly because I can't remember five minutes ago half the time. A lot of yeah, oh gosh, they're, just, the they're, they're losing, they're losing the yeah, it is a lot. They're losing their mind over Yoko. I can't believe that old goat's still going. You know, we did I drive mean, her out not, of the Dakota, but she's still kicking. Yeah, she's she like moved away, moved off, think, didn't she? We made her move off. We how, she zigzagged. How old is, how old is she? Oh Lord, I don't know. In what kind of years? <laughs> in dog years, I don't know. I don't she, know is, she just turned 91 years old back in February. Wow. Wow. Sorry, I didn't mean to whistle in the microphone. Mm. Oh, you did you really? Do tell. You know, did you did you deafen yourself with a sharp pencil? I was just gonna say, did you get like radiation or anything like that? Or you know, did you start setting off Geiger counters or or uh, I don't know, maybe start hearing music on your fillings, or you should have to have some kind of effect just getting too close to her, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would think so. Monica, third, Dubai, third yeah, degree bones. I, I remember that from Facebook. That's where I, that just always stuck with me. That was a, a funny one about Stephen King and Quentin Tarantino and Yoko Ono. You said hi. You just said, hi. did she say hi back? Did she make? Did you make eye contact? Did you, you lose twenty five pounds when you know made eye contact? Like that's more did like she make that contact. dolphin noise. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's terrible, isn't it? Terrible. Oh gosh, it's the strange people in this world. I don't know, but it's really it's it is kind of neat that I guess people, certain actors and certain musicians, whatever they have a goal to you know come up with a persona. You know, so it's not our fault if we think about, you know, like when you think about Alice Cooper right away, you start thinking about, you know, schools out or, you know, you get flashes of a visual yeah. of what it and calls the up. Eye makeup and, and all that. Yeah. 
No more Mr. Nice Guy, the top hat, the cane. You know, more than likely a guillotine on stage, something like that going on. Welcome to my nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, that was, what a tour that was. You know, those were the days. We had the bands, Steve. I'm telling you. And it was so neat, too, because you could just walk in. I can remember many a field or football stadiums or parks or whatever where you could just look and there would be several stages going and, you know, just band after band after band, you know. Some of them, you know, you saw before you knew who they were, you know, really they became who they were, you know. Yep. So I did that with Loggins and Messina. I remember sitting there. They were playing at uh, an Asbury Park and Convention Hall, and I was sitting on the beach. I remember looking up. And, and seeing the uh, the marquee and seeing them up there and I can't remember who they were with and who do, you know who'd have thought that you know by the time you know a year had rolled around they were like one of my favorite bands they were in my top like 25 you know but I didn't get to go see them then I was so close but I had no idea who they were and then later on did the same thing with Ramones too mm -hmm. you know, I pulled a, a Ramones um, promo album out of a stack of probably 50. And I, I spent, I was, I was drinking whiskey. I was in a mood. I was over at my friend's house. This was in high school. And it was over at my friend's house. She said, Hey man, I got to listen to all these albums. I got to listen to like a sample of each and write down what I think about it. You know, I guess her sister had paid her to, anyway, I got caught up. So I'm sitting there and I'm half gone. And she's like, listen to this one. What do you think? I'm like, garbage, 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 Garbage. I'm, Hold on. Wait a minute. Back up. Go, go back one. And that was the Ramones. And I pulled it out and I set it over here. And every other, every other one, it was like she had a couple she liked or whatever. And this was like a whole, at least a year, year and a half before I ever knew who the Ramones were. I said, they're going to be something. They got something, you know, little Joey jumping up and down and all that mess. So listen, are you in, around in your new abode? Do you have any lighthouses that you know about i don't um, i have a video i don't think they hit anything in massachusetts uh, the, the boston harbor light is not too far from here and i haven't been up there to take a look at it yet but it's it's uh i think it's america's oldest lighthouse if i'm not mistaken is it really but, uh, it's got some some tales about it let me just pull something up here real sure quick. go ahead take your time uh boston light it's, cuckoo it's, town uh, hold on we got a question Hi, Steve. Great topic. As for Yoko, what uh, <laughs> you heard her singing? I'm sorry. I'm still in recovery. Saw the Ramones in London many years ago. I loved their simplicity. It was fun. Yeah, you know, and welcome aboard. Um, I'm, I'm, most, I'm in Jersey, so at that time, they were in New York all the time, CB, CBGBs, you know, all over. They were playing in some of the same bars our band was playing in. You know, we just miss some of these people. Or again, you know, we'd be there and we'd open for somebody or we'd be part of a group, you know, four or five bands playing, you know, one right after the other and find out one of those groups went off and was like, oh, man, you know, they hit big. And it was so it just seemed like it was so much, but that was going everywhere, you know. Know what I mean? Did you find what you was hunting? Yeah, it's just it's. Uh, oh, this is Mark. <laughs> 12 miles out in Boston hey, Harbor. Sits Is Boston it? Light, America's first lighthouse. Sits atop a grassy drumlin called Little Brewster. And uh, yeah, there's a, a story that was in Yankee Magazine about a little girl and her family that spent some time caring for the light in 1947. And she had some strange experiences. If, if you do a search on Yankee uh, Magazine, gosh, I remember uh, that. Yeah, I used so to remember that when I was a kid. Yep. For that and fate. Gosh, I love fate. Mm -hmm. fate, fate was great. It was like Reader's Digest for the paranormal, yeah. for paranormalists. And it, and it even <laughs> came in that little digest size and just, yeah. just love and just it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it had the best ads in the back, too. Yep. And it had <laughs> a little, hey, there's Vixen. Hey, sweetie. Uh, stop just a second. I want to make sure, Vixen, that you get a hold of Lynn. Uh, to go to her omnipresent email. She sent me an email the other uh, day, maybe yesterday. And I'm not sure if you guys connected since then. So I'm just, my due diligence, I want to make sure you get your books. Okay. Love you, baby. Welcome in. Hey, trusty turnip. Welcome, welcome. Hugs back. Hugs back. David Byrne have his big suit. On. David Byrne. Um, I saw, actually spoke with him on the boardwalk in Asbury Park. I saw the Talking Heads, 
The B fifty twos open for the talking heads. And I promise you, her hair was bigger than Marge Simpson's. <laughs> you know, when they came up, remember they'd have the big bow with the big tall blue hair or whatever. They were terrific. For what they did, they were terrific. They were, that was right. That was probably before Love Shack, maybe Rock Lobster. I think Rock Lobster they were doing. You know, that's that's how long ago. You know, but wow. And I, there was no lighthouses there, though. You know, not from there. But that's that's very cool. All right, so I've got a video. If you would like to see, I thought I would go ahead listen to a story. And then we'll stop and we'll talk about it. But I'm not 100% sure if, um, look, there's so many haunted lighthouses. We could, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I think that's what I started out saying in the beginning is, what do you think about, you know, is it because of the rocks? You know, there's rocks, there's. Yeah, and the rocks and the spiral stairs and just that single point. And a lot of them are, you know, of course, they're on the coast. The sometimes too. they're out on like a little island thing. Out yeah. There. At um, Oregon, the, a lot of the, the when I lived out there, there's some creepy lighthouses on the Oregon coast, and then uh, of course here in New England, they're all up and down, and then uh, down the Outer Banks, there's uh, Cape Hatteras and some of those places. I've visited those lighthouses too. There, they've got they've all they just they feel strange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was wondering too, um, because of the water, because of the turmoil, because of the all of the stuff and the activity there, you've got, you know, for eons, it's always uh, a sign of life, if you know what I mean. Everybody's fishing there from, you go back tribal, whoever was ever there, prehistoric, whatever, that you know that they were at least near the ocean, um, getting that food out of there and, and trying to fish and trying to travel or go back and forth from island to island, whatever. It was always a part of life. And so much death too because you've got so many shipwrecks you've got um ships crashing on the rocks you got the moon uh, wreckers that we've talked about where that did that That's intentionally yeah you know put a mule up there or a donkey with a, a lantern and yep. somebody would walk it back and forth and uh, lead ships onto the rocks so they could plunder the ships yep yep and also you had here um, in New Jersey and, you know, anywhere again, coastal, but I know a little bit more about that, this, because I live here. So, um, y here we had, uh, all the immigrant ships going from everywhere in through Ellis Island. So they would pass our coast. So right here, before they would get into New York, they would try to draw them in if it was a foggy night. And that's why they called them moon cursors because they would curse the moon because the moon would be so bright, you know, they would see, and they, you know, it would be a, a slack night because they're not going to get anybody. But these people would actually do everything in their power to get these ships to wreck on the rocks, on the jetties, you know, um, and, you know, wait for the survivors to try to swim to shore. Or they would go, you know, out on the wreckage with their boats, whatever. But a lot of them, the saddest thing is, you know, you make it through all that, you make it to shore. There's a bunch of land pirates there ready to mug you and get all your gold and your family jewels, I guess, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, because they would put all of the riches really in the hem of their clothes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they knew this and they would dig down deep in their pockets and the lining of their coats and their pants and their, you know, the cuffs of their uh, hems of their dresses and uh, take all their stuff. And I heard later on in life stories that came back to me from several different people of you used to be able to have a little bonfire on the beach here when I was in, a teenager. You know, there's so many laws now. It's insane. They just ruined it. They ruined it for everybody. <laughs> but anyway, you used to be able to do that, play the guitar, drink a little couple beers, bought, pass around a bottle of Boone's Farm, whatever have a good time and sometimes people would stay on the beach and they would like stay you know under the boardwalk on the blankets whatever fall asleep pass out whatever i wish i could say this never happened to me but i've got stories so anyway <laughs> <laughs> after the fact you know when all those years were over i start hearing stories of people that they did that here where i live on you know on our beach and woke up to a ghost that looked very much like a pirate, very, um, 
you know, period clothes or whatever, for whatever flashes that they saw. But basically, they're getting rustled awake by a ghost trying to mug them. And those were um, ghosts of uh, moon wreckers and basically land pirates, right, Steve? When you yep. call them that? Yeah, that's a good good word for them. Land pirates, yeah. <laughs> now we've got different kinds, but, you know, I digress. <laughs> so anyway, this is a nice little documentary. And um, it's it is great. It's up for grabs. So I thought, hey, this is this is good because it tells several different stories. And like I was saying last night, Steve and I have always yielded to uh, the older shows. Um, you know, the sightings, the ones like I showed last night with um, the extraordinary out of Australia and the, the wonderful um, uh, ghostly encounters out of Canada. You know, shows of this ilk that took time to tell the history. Um, and the backstory without so much extra over dramatization um, to where you don't even know what you're looking at anymore. And you don't even really believe the story, you know, but it's not the witness's fault. It's not the experiencer's fault. It's the way they did the show. So I think this one fits the bill. Um, it's a nice little uh, documentary. I thought we could watch a couple and talk about it. If um, I wanted to ask before I started that uh, though, Steve, there's been several missing people cases yeah, in lighthouses. There, there was one I covered, and I can't remember where it was, but uh, they were just gone. They don't know yeah. what happened to them. They were on one of those that's like out on something in the bay. And uh, I think one or two of the lighthouse cases, they had coats that they hung, you know, like the, uh -huh. the big rain coats, the, the, the really or whatever. Sorry. And uh, one of those was missing, but there was uh, two guys were, were staying there, and they just disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to them. If somebody kidnapped them, if they got washed over, but there wasn't any uh, killer waves or anything that they, they did. I'll have to find that story, and uh, probably right. one of these you've got here. Right here. This is the one I pulled. Now, I have no idea if this picture goes with this news clipping, but. I remember a story where all similar to what you just told, but there was three and they were trying to figure out if I think this one for the uh, article is in Edinburgh. Yeah, um, I believe that's the one I covered the Flannan Isles lighthouse. Okay. Uh, in the uh, Ted Branston territory. Is it uh, Ted? Do you know about uh, this? Well, the West coast of Scotland. So I don't know, but it's off the coast of Scotland. Ted, do you know about this one? A fake, a fact, a fake fact checker. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Okay, so um, anyway, I don't know, but I thought that was so mysterious. And the one I heard was very similar to the one you were just saying. And they couldn't figure out if it was a murder suicide or if it was a, uh, if it was you know they were attacked. I mean, there's so many different stories that go around it, and I don't know if I'm melting a couple of different ones together. And I guess that's my question It's there's more than one case of missing people that go, have gone vanished without a trace and no idea what happened to them. And there's more than one out of lighthouses. Is that right? Yep. I think that's the confusion because, you know, it's not just one story. There's so many that they, they kind of start melting together, I think. Yeah. So anyway, that was interesting. And I have no idea. I've heard the stories. I have no idea what, what could have happened. And I think that's, again, the creepy thing. And in this movie, the, I guess, Poe spinoff or an unfinished short story of Poe's, that lighthouse uh, thing, that's the, the devastating thing that they bring up. It's the madness. It's the loneliness. It's the being secluded completely and not having a choice because it's apparent that when these guys are dropped off, they have to wait for somebody to come get them. You know, I don't know if I'd ever put myself in that position. It's just already, you know, a, res a recipe for disaster, I think. I don't know. It's like you. these guys that work on those offshore rigs, you know, oil yeah. and drilling and stuff. They take you, they drop you off, and then they drop off supplies and things, and then they come back and get you in a month or two. Um, also, there used to be a really, really good kids show. I think it's from the probably sometime in the seventies, it's based out of Australia called round the twist. And, uh, it's about a, a family that, uh, went and lived in to, to be lighthouse keepers and the lighthouse in the area is haunted. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's here on YouTube what? round the twist. 
look it up. It's got that. Like totally, I want to see it now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's it's yeah. really good. Now it's, it's a little it's, series. What country did it come out of? Australia. Australia. And, and it's an actual lighthouse, uh, the Point Naranda Lighthouse in Victoria, Australia. Sounds like something I'd like to see. At least I'll check it out. That's for sure. Yeah, I think you in know. the first episode there was a ghost in the privy. It had an outhouse, and uh, they, they, oh, that's was, awesome! There, there I got to go look it up. <laughs> you like it? That yeah, I can't wait. And it's on YouTube. I, I'm pretty sure there yeah. are at least some episodes on hey, YouTube. Hey, mods, if if somebody can find that, please. If uh, Cat's in here, I know Ted's here, if, uh, but you guys might not. I'm finding out that not everything is available in other countries on YouTube. So. You know, if 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 somebody does have a link to that, drop it in the chat. Love to pick up on, it, especially since it's the theme and it's ghost. But um, I'm finding a lot of stuff in Australia has got some really uh, good paranormal programs as well. You know, we're missing. That's the one good thing about the internet. You know, when we were kids. We were missing. We didn't know what they had. You know, and probably had no chance at that time to ever see in it. See, you know. But now look at it. Now we can reach out and we can see what Canada has in the paranormal category, what they're offering, you know, as far as television shows and what they might not think is a big deal is brand new to us. I, I did find it. It's it's actually late eighties, early nineties show. It's not as old as I that's, thought it was. But uh that's still in the realm of probably I, being I pretty dropped, good. dropped a playlist there that's got all the episodes and uh oh how cool. The, the first episode is a uh, skeleton on the dunny, which you know that's their what they call the the bathroom there, the the toilet. Dunny, oh, wow! See, and you get, and you can learn stuff too. I just love it. I love getting new stuff like that. That's but, uh, awesome. Jack here saw a walk. ghost walking up a dock towards him. He thought it was a human. That's usually how it is, isn't it, Steve? Same to you. Same happened with you mm -hmm. uh, more than one occasion. I asked who they were, and they didn't respond. Then I saw that it was a ghost and yelled, don't come any closer, and it didn't. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, gosh, that just conjures up all kinds of stories popping into my head with that. You know you know which one comes to mind is uh, the one Mark told on here the other night. That was a good story. Yeah. About the train station and the, uh, the vicar. Yeah, that, that was. So interesting. That he would think, you know, that the, the vicar would think that or or find out or feel that if he came back and he helped, maybe in some ways it was helping him too. He had a lot of burden to get off of him, you know, all that heavy stuff, you know. That's amazing. Time after time, we're hearing it, Steve. Yep. There's so much to this, uh, uh, this spirit world, but it just seems to be more simple. Most simple, complicated thing I've ever been involved in. <laughs> yeah. How about that? All right, let me see if I can find that right one again. This is it. This is it. Oh, this is so cute. I had to throw it in. I found it again, and it's so sweet. If you haven't seen it, you're going to love it. It's not a human that's doing it. Somebody has walked over your grave. Oh God, I can feel it, but I can't look. I'm too scared to look. It's the ghost. It's the girl. Don't you see that? Something more unnerving than you could ever imagine. Question everything. Haunted. Weeknights at 9 on Discovery Civilization. 
Lighthouses are beacons of safety. But a lighthouse can harbor a darker side. A secret history. A touch of mystery. A glimpse into the unknown. Or encounter with the unknowable. The United States has hundreds of lighthouses along its coastlines, and at least a few of them offer more than a guiding beacon to mariners lost at sea. Things are not always what they seem, but strange things have been happening in America's lighthouses. A mother searches for her drowned child. A long-dead keeper cannot abandon his watch. And a ghost of a lighthouse cat still stalks the stairs. At the end of the 19th century, lighthouses were built all along the eastern and western coasts of America, particularly on the rocky, shipwreck-prone shores of New England and Oregon. At the boundary of land and sea, the lighthouse is often at the boundary of the tangible and the intangible. It is no surprise that there are many mysterious tales associated with the lighthouses. At the end of the 19th century, on a remote part of the Oregon coast, a Kena Bay lighthouse was the scene of a mystery. Built in 1871, the lighthouse was only in operation for less than three years. It was replaced by a taller beacon, a mile to the north at Yakina Head. The little beacon on the bay was abandoned and neglected for many years. During that time, a tragedy occurred. And now the Aquina Bay Lighthouse is said to be possessed by a spirit. The stories have been handed down through the generations by sailors, visitors, and lighthouse keepers. Whether it's true or not, we don't know, but we have a lot of versions that indicate that something happened here after the lighthouse was abandoned, someone disappeared, and it's quite a mystery. The story first appeared in a magazine article in 1899 entitled The Haunted Light. And the story is dark and disturbing. In the late 1800s, 16-year-old Muriel Trevenard disappeared without a trace in broad daylight at the Aquina Bay Lighthouse. Muriel had come with her father, a sea captain, to stay with friends that summer in the tiny seashore town of Aquina Bay. One morning, Muriel and her companions ventured out for a picnic on the cliffs surrounding the lighthouse. Passing the beacon, Muriel was drawn to it as though a voice inside was calling her name. But there was no voice. The lighthouse was abandoned. What happened next is completely unknown. Records from that time give us no clue as to Muriel's fate. One thing seems certain. Muriel Travenar disappeared forever that day. Or did she? There are reports that, that her spirit still roams here. We don't know where she went bodily, what happened to her, but it seems as if it was a tragedy, whatever it was, and perhaps her spirit remains on uh, to solve that mystery. I had heard the story or the legend of Muriel. I had a friend visiting from out of state and we were just passing through the park looking at the sights. I was driving and we both kind of glanced up at the lighthouse up uh, where the beacon is and we saw this um, white ephemeral shape just kind of floating by the windows at the top. I told her then the story that it was supposed to be a haunted lighthouse and um, she confirmed we probably saw the ghost. A trick of light, or a spirit on the roam. Witnesses at Aquina Bay know that they have seen something extraordinary. I um, frequently hear stories um, about ghostly experiences that people have had. One of my favorites, actually, was um, a couple that I met uh, here visiting the lighthouse one day told me the story of their daughter's wedding. Uh, they said that um, during the wedding, they had their daughter come down the stairs in her wedding gown, and they took pictures. 
and that when they got the pictures developed, there was a ghostly image in the photo behind uh, her daughter that looked like a woman. Look at that, Steve. I thought that was really interesting. And I actually read about this story before. I don't know if you'd ever heard about it, but that's quite amazing. It almost looks like she's like following her down the stairs. You know? Yeah, yeah. I can see it. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. A ghostly image in the photo behind uh, her daughter that looked like a woman. They thought it was Muriel. I was pretty astounded that I actually got to see her. I think I saw a ghost. Over a hundred years ago, something or someone took the life of Muriel Trevenard. Her body was never recovered, and it seems today her spirit is still restless. But Muriel is not the only ghost to haunt a lighthouse in these parts. Just to the north of the Equina Bay Beacon is the lighthouse that replaced it. Equina Head Lighthouse is Oregon's tallest, throwing its light almost 30 kilometers out to sea. Since it was first lit in 1873, rumors have persisted that the lighthouse on Equina Head is also haunted. A keeper in the 1930s wrote, Someone unseen would come in and go up the spiral stairs on certain dark nights. The keeper believed he lived with a ghost in his tower for 22 years, sometimes following close behind the phantom as it wound its way up to the lantern room. He heard it on the stairs almost every night, but never caught a glimpse of it. Since the beacon is now automated, a keeper no longer maintains the light but staff and visitors have reported hearing unexplained sounds in the tower. Most recently, a lighthouse volunteer. I came in this morning by myself. Usually there are two of us. I heard voices, like maybe a man and a woman talking very, very softly. I was just curious, where is that sound coming from? I still don't know. Nothing was there, nothing. Nobody but me and the voices. While some officials try to dispel the ghostly rumors, the townspeople insist they are true. They believe the spirit of an old keeper still rattles around somewhere inside the Aquina Head Tower. I am not going to put myself in the position of saying it is haunted, but it could be. Two lighthouses on the same bay, both beautiful and both haunted by their pasts. Is it me? I think she might be related to the ghost hunters. Remember when they would always go, ah, I'm not going to say it's haunted. But, you know, we did see the, you know, table fly, you know, around and, yeah. you, you know, your dog went, you know, flying through the living room. But, you know, we're not, we're not ready to say. <laughs> not ready I understand to why, but, you know, I understand why I'm just, I'm just goofing off on them. But the way she said that, it was just like she was so careful, you know, so she could she could still go to the country club or wherever it was, you know, her, her friends sit around playing bridge or whatever, and, and they wouldn't make fun. Of her. I'm not going to say it's haunted, but, you know, I heard voices, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's it still got that, that stigma, you know, even now. I think I'm still surprised now when I bump into people that don't believe that something's going on, whether it's a Bigfoot or UFOs or ghosts or whatever it may be that's outside of whatever their norm is. Because I've been around it for so long, you know, are, are you still surprised? Do you get still get into circles where you're like, you know, you, you, you nobody knows what you do and you're just kind of like keeping it that way because you're not sure how they, <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? I do the same thing. And it's it's weird. It's almost like you have to stop yourself because, you know, you get so used to talking about it. It's funny. You know, it's we've come so far yet, you know, not far enough, I guess. Nearly a coincidence. Or are ghosts, like mariners, drawn to the powerful beacons of a lighthouse?
What can stir the imagination like a lonely lighthouse perched high on a cliff overlooking the sea? That was the brilliant. perfect spot for a good old-fashioned ghost story. I think that people um, love ghost stories, um, and particularly lighthouse ghosts. The isolation and the lonely spots that they're typically in sort of lends itself to ghost stories getting started. Mm -hmm. Lighthouses are romantic, and ghosts are romantic. The romance of lighthouses often lies in the spectacular beauty hey, of their hey, remote locations. Hasita Head is no exception. About a three-hour drive from Portland, past miles of isolated beaches and a rocky Oregon coast, this remarkable lighthouse is majestic, just like the scenery itself. Hasita Head Lighthouse and Keeper's Quarters perch on top of a wedge of rock jutting out into the Pacific Ocean. Here, it isn't the lighthouse that's haunted, it's the Keeper's Quarters. The house was built in 1894 and has been restored and is now a bed and breakfast. Guests are treated to everything you might expect at an upmarket B&B, but sometimes they get more than they bargained for. Over the breakfast table, some have told stories of a strange visitor to their room, a brush with a mysterious ghost known as Rue. Rue's been here a number of years. This is the urban legend. This is folklore at best. Uh, but the, the stories have been passed down just like every other story that, that has come to be a legend. And Rue's very much uh, a part of the history of this facility here. According to the legend, uh, there was a lightkeeper's wife who uh, lost her only child, uh, the girl drowned out in the cistern or was lost in the ocean and uh, the mother was distraught with grief and uh, killed herself. There's actually an unmarked grave out here somewhere for the child. Some have looked, but no one knows for certain where the child is buried. I believe that this area in here uh, is where the gravesite is. Even the young girl's name is unknown. But many here believe both mother and child are an inseparable part of Hasita Head's tragic history. This is not a real old lighthouse. And people tend to think that the older a lighthouse, the more haunted it is. But this, this lighthouse is only about 100 years old. It was built in the 1890s. And it was a very difficult life for the keepers at that time because it was so isolated. It was a good uh, 15, 18 miles by a wagon road to get to any civilization. And so that sets us up for the idea of mortality. It was very hard for children here, and uh, it seems as if some of the early keepers lost some of their children in infancy and early childhood. And this has led to some speculation that maybe there are some spirits roaming the grounds here. There's the history of someone dying, and then there are the experiences with the ghost. And generally speaking, the experiences with the ghost uphold the historical background very well. Historians have tried to match up the folklore around the ghostly sightings with the early records from the lighthouse. I think the legend goes back to the tenure of Frank and Jenny DeRoy. He came here in the late 1890s as an assistant keeper and then went on to become the principal keeper. And they were here a very long time. Uh, she came as a young woman. She probably uh, lost a child during that time. So I think that it may be her that uh, people think they're seeing here. I don't get wrapped up in trying to prove or disprove of the ghost stories. Uh, and I personally, when something happens, I'm trying to figure out ways that uh, perhaps uh, I can explain these odd uh, circumstances. And I've come to uh, realize that there's things that happen here that I just simply can't explain. And uh, that mystery is okay with me. Many visitors have strange tales to tell, and they weren't all believers to begin with. The interesting thing, this is the, the part that really gets me, is that the people who have the most intense experiences with the ghost were the people who came in skeptic at first. Like myself, they came in disbelieving that ghosts were possible. Hasita Head is 
well known for the ghost. Uh, other people that have come in don't believe in it, and I'm sure that they leave still not believing in it. I don't think she shows up for everybody. I think that that's one of the things that's very particular about the spirit world is it will only hit you when you're least expecting it. I've never seen a, an apparition or anything conventionally ghostly, uh, but there are certain times when I'll be sitting somewhere and I have, there's, there's no choice. You have to look. We've had guests who um, have had her come sit on the bed. Um, they'll be sitting on the side of the bed and all of a sudden there's a, a, an impression beside them on the bed. And um, some people have uh, enjoyed that, others have come screaming downstairs, what's going on? So definitely has a spirit here. I I've caught glimpses of her out of the corner of my eye. I've never faced her face on, but I've, I've felt her in the room. As I saw her, I would have swore that she was human. I would put her at the very turn of the century the early 1900s, and I have seen her. I turned to the gentleman behind me, and he said, did you see that? And I went, thank you, Lord, someone else saw her. She was bending over, fluffing the pillows on the bed, and she was dressed in the black, all, it was an all-black outfit, though. She seems to be searching for something, and possibly it's, it's the child she lost. Or possibly the child's grave. Rue's search keeps leading back to the house where she may have once lived, she has been seen all over the house. One of my worst experiences was in the attic, and I didn't know where the light switch was at this point. I was uh, a new employee here, and I had to go up there. It was enough to make me gather my cool and walk all the way across the attic with my lighter out. You can see 15 feet across the room, and on the opposite wall was a face. And when I got there, it wasn't a face any longer. It was just the wall. There was nothing there. But I swear, that first moment I saw it, there was a clear as day face staring at me. The best known sighting of her um, came when there was a workman up in the attic doing some repairs, and he was at a window. This is probably where it happened in the attic, uh, perhaps at this window. I want to stop it there real quick because this reminds me of something I wanted to tell you. When the stuff that, you know, still baffles me about this, like a lot of the stories you'll hear if a mass or, now not always, but in a lot of stories, if there's like a, like say a black mass or a gray shadow, you know, that kind of comes in and, and, and grows, maybe does whatever it comes in a corner. Okay. Um, usually from a corner for, so a ceiling and, and two walls, I don't hear a whole lot of it coming out of the floor corners, but I'm sure that I'm sure that it, you know, it exists. There's something about these angles is what I'm getting at. Also, there is something, more than one thing about a mirror. We've heard that there are portals, um, so many other things, reflections, and so many stories you're hearing of what we just saw. Somebody looking in the mirror, seeing something standing behind them, looking, they don't see it, but they still see them in the mirror. I'm saying all that to get to this point. Um, I'm watching a show, and I believe it was um, Nino Rodriguez was hosting Steve. And you know who I mean when I say Steve How to Hunt. And he's been doing a lot of good stuff on Bigfoot and, you know, talking about stories and, you know, and things. Last week, he came out and, and told a story a guy had written in from another YouTube channel. And he didn't remember the channel off the top of his head. 
but I do believe he said it was um, uh, an, an indigenous man um, out of um, Tor you know Toronto, Canada, or Alberta. I can't remember which one. But anyway, if you know the channel, now he's out there just walking around in the woods. And he often takes uh, visuals, you know, for deer and animals and whatever and, you know, trails, you know, that he's walking. And he does other things, too. So this day, and he's very um, in tune with nature. He's got, you know, he's got that, that tribal native thing going down. And he's talking about how nice everything is and the weather's nice and this is going on and you know the trees are starting to bud and yada yada then all of a sudden he starts like i hear something you know and he starts to get into that kind of all, almost like a militaristic kind of you know where you fall into your training you know and he's talking about um i can hear it it's you know it sounds larger than bear because he can tell by the sound of the sticks and the way that the things are crunching and the, and the, almost the, the stride of, of the thing that's walking, he's trying to figure it out and put it together. But the sound almost, the way he was describing it, it sounded almost like one of our ghost experiencers who's talking about how the sound moves it's coming from different places in the room. He's he's like, it's coming from different places in the woods, right? And then, Steve, he says, it's right in front of me. I hear it. I feel it. It's right in front of me. And he's standing in a clearing. And there's a wood, you know, like wood line around him. And he's taking the picture um, with his camera, I'm, you know, probably, a, you know, on a stick or whatever. And he's got the wood line around him and he goes home and he looks at the footage, you know, sounds like every paranormal, yeah. you know, investigator story you ever heard. And he's looking at the footage and he catches this one thing because he's trying to talk to his audience. I don't know if he did this live or, or released it live. I do not know, but he was recording it and he was talking to, his, you know, his, his followers, his subscribers whatever and he's flipping back and forth steve so he's getting like i'm looking out and now i flipped it now you're looking at me you're looking at my face but he's not moving the camera so he's hitting that little thing that flips it back and forth right and he gets a couple of those and when he gets home he sees this now he happens to be wearing sorry it took me this long to get to it but all those parts are important he happens to be wearing polaroid sunglasses and they weren't full Polaroids. It, it wasn't like the mirrored aviators, you know, that are just straight mirror. They were dark, but they did have a reflection. And in the reflection, I shit you not, he's looking right in front of him. And when he's saying, it's right in front of me, I feel it. I don't see anything. In the reflection, there's the Bigfoot standing right in front of him. Wow. Face and all, but it's in the glasses. So now you have through the camera, th through his lens, he can't see it, through the camera, back again, reflected back into the camera. They're in a different light spectrum, Steve. Yep, I believe that. They're in a different light spectrum when they want to be, just like ghosts. Similar. What do you think? I, I totally agree, yeah. They've uh, somehow learned or... Maybe it's just built into them that they can change their vibration to a lower, higher frequency. Because if you look okay. at the light spectrum, yes. the part that we can see is like here, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. actually like wider than mm -hmm. I can hold my hands. Mm -hmm. We see just a narrow portion of it. Right. So if that being true, if, if we accept that as being true and chat for just for a minute, we're going to go ahead and accept that for being true, because I'm hearing all kinds of things about, there, you know, mammals that certain can't see things in the red spectrum, um, 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 paying a lot of attention to certain, um, let's just say gadgets that can dial up to a certain spectrum and, you know, take out everything but a certain color. You know what I mean? Just uh, things like this. It goes across the, the board. So when you're talking about the supernatural and, and 
all this other stuff and the things that we're seeing coming at us right now and things that we're hearing being talked about, about the veil thinning and seeing more creatures in the wild or cryptids or, you know, humanoids hanging off the edge of buildings, looking at, you know, a city that is being devoured by hatred and evil and dark things, you know, obviously taken over, you know, at least, um, thriving there. Um, I think it's all connected, man. And I think it's possible maybe certain people are seeing this because they too are raising into that kind of vibrate, even like ever so often, maybe not there and staying. Some do probably, but I think it's amazing. And I think we're going to see this unpeeling faster and faster. It just feels that way. I mean, Art Bell was talking about it. Bob, you know, Cooper, you know, name them all. I mean, you, how far back you want to go? Einstein, Edgar Casey, for Pete's sakes. You know, at, when was Casey? He was a twenties, early nineteen hundreds, twenties, thirties, somewhere in there. Twenties, thirties. Yeah. I think there's something to this um, light spectrum thing, and I think it has something to do with maybe a, along the same lines as why we see the ghosts in the reflection. No, we're not going through glasses too, but hey, maybe that's just another layer to the formula that that works. And I can't help but think, this is how my crazy mind works. This is kind of crap I'm doing at work while I'm making, you know, wedding flowers and stuff. So, <laughs> so I mean, it made me think of the old movie, the old version of 13 Ghosts. Remember the old version of 13 Ghosts where... The guy had a special pair of glasses that helped you see mm -hmm. the ghosts, right? Now, they brought it forward when they did the remake, which absolutely is horrific, if you ask me. It's just terrible. Most remakes are. But they brought that forward, but I'm sure they had a whole nother, you know, reasoning for that. I'd be more interested to go back and see what the reasoning was with the glasses and how. I think it was an uncle that died and left him to the kid that was a little kid that was really kind of you know, getting all the, the ideas that were, you know, this dead uncle. They inherited the house, didn't they, in 13 Ghosts? Uh, and they got there and they started yeah. finding all this hidden stuff from the wacky, crazy uncle or whatever. And the uncle was the one who had the, kind of like a Tesla kind of guy. Very interesting. I'd love to see if maybe they were letting go some little secrets back then, Steve. Yeah. You know how they do. All right, so do you have any more on this? I think we've got one more story. You ready to go for another? Yeah, let's let's do another one. Roll that All beautiful right, game footage. There we go. Are you liking it so far, guys? It's good. It's a good little documentary, and it's got a good um good little way of telling the story and all. Past to the disturbing encounters in the attic, most residents, past and present, enjoy memories of Rue as a friendly spirit, a welcome companion in the house. I know that she is here. She, her presence is definitely here. It really didn't ever bother me. It almost made me, I don't know, it was almost a comforting feeling at times. I'd be sitting in a room, I could feel just a slight breeze and sort of a chill would go down my back and I knew that she was there. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. I feel very comfortable with it. Whatever the spirit is, it really appreciates the fact that there's things going on here. It could definitely be a very spooky and decrepit old place if it was allowed to be. I haven't seen uh, Rue in broad daylight uh, floating towards me, which seems to be the, you know, the proof that everybody wants. But I have seen a lot of things out of the corner of my eyes and uh, I've, I've experienced strange things here in the house as well. Uh, it's for the best that I haven't seen her because I have to live here. The western coast of the United States has been shaped by the forces of the Pacific Ocean. In Oregon, in at least two lighthouses and one lightkeeper's home, people have felt the presence of other forces that no one can adequately explain. But ghostly sightings are not limited to the West Coast. On the other side of America, on the Atlantic coast, the state of Maine has the highest concentration of lighthouses in the United States. 
but one lighthouse stands out for its dramatic location and its ghostly legends. There are a lot of stories here that are unexplainable. I definitely say Owl's Head is one of Maine's haunted lighthouses. To find the pine-covered cliffs of Owl's Head, journey up the Atlantic coast, an hour north of Portland, Maine, straight through the heart of lobster country. On your way, plenty of... the eyes and beak of an owl on the rocky outcroppings. Whatever they saw is not evident today. What is apparent, however, is that someone has been tending the lighthouse when no one is supposed to be there. Over the years, I've had a lot of keepers tell me stories about Owl's Head. And one of them is, of course, the mystery of the footprints. It's been told to me many, many times over that mysterious footprints appear, especially after a light rain. And the mystery is they only go one direction. They come up the ramp, they go up the stairs, and they get to the tower. And then if you continue on, you will find that the brass has been cleaned and the lens has been cleaned. Now that is a mystery. To me, it is possible that the presence of a lighthouse keeper could still be, uh, in some form, still present at a lighthouse after his death, uh, because they were so uh, emotionally tied in with those places. I don't know the explanation, but it's, it's not that much of a leap of imagination to me to think that, in some form, they would uh, hang around to take care of that light. These keepers that lived in this period of history, they were just workers. They didn't want anything to ever go wrong with the lighthouse. A man that was dedicated knew that if anything fouled up with equipment or anything fouled up with his light, that a disaster could occur. Sometimes when they die, their spirit stays behind. And I think there's a keeper at Owl's Head. I would uh, have an open mind on that subject. I uh, am cautiously uh, open-minded <laughs> on the idea of uh, a keeper's spirit still uh, existing at, at a lighthouse like this. If the spirit of a dead lighthouse keeper shows up at Al's head on occasion, no one seems surprised. But a family who once lived in the keeper's quarters was more than a little startled at finding a ghost in their child's bedroom. I'm very fascinated by uh, the story of uh, Debbie Graham and her husband, uh, Gerard, who were here in the 80s, and uh, they had a small daughter who uh, experienced uh, some unusual things. We really never felt anything until we were started, you know, started paying attention to my younger child. She'd wake up in the middle of the night and she would meet her dad at the top of the stairs and she'd tell her daddy to turn on the foghorn. How would a two-year-old know to come and tell her daddy to turn on the foghorn? The Grahams believed that their daughter was being visited by the spirit world. It really didn't take that long for us to figure out, like, what the heck's going on here, you know? I mean, we've got something in here that's telling her what to do. She always felt the presence of him, and that was in the room that was haunted. Who is this? And that's what I always wanted to know. Who could this be? Why else would a ghost be in that lighthouse if he wasn't a keeper? Maybe this is not surprising. It is often children who are most open to the paranormal. She was connected. She was there. She was there with the spirit. It was, it was Claire, and, Claire and the ghost. There's been many, many strange things that go on in the house. So I would say that if a little girl has lived in that house, she senses the keeper. It could be his footprints that go up the ramp and up to the tower. 
he may be the one who's cleaning the brass and who's also cleaning the lens. I do not know what the explanation is for these uh, events at Owl's Head Light, but there seems to be there seems to be a consistency with several of the people who have lived there in the house have experienced very similar events. If I'm in my room listening to the ocean and I'll just be doing my thing, I always feel like there's somebody there. Sometimes you have a feeling like there's a presence watching over you, and I hate to use the word haunted. I wouldn't say haunted because it's a scary word, but I would say that there are spirits there or there's things happening there that are more than just coincidence. Something is going on. Maybe someday we'll understand it all. A small girl communicating with a keeper's ghost. Brass fixtures and a lens that clean themselves. Footsteps left in the night. The chilling North Atlantic coast has seen its share of the unexplained. And her lighthouses keep the legends alive. No one can say when this beacon was first suspected of being a haunted lighthouse. A little further to the north of Owl's Head, Prospect Harbor is remote, even by main standards. About five hours from the city of Boston, it is nestled in the craggy sea coast, just a few miles from the Canadian border. First lit in 1891, Prospect Harbor Lighthouse was established to help a large fleet of fishing boats navigate through the harbor. Today, the keeper's quarters are used as a recreational facility for United States Navy personnel. They call it Gull Cottage. And for anyone who wants to be alone, this is the place. People come a long way for the privacy. Unexpected guests almost never drop by, but sometimes strange visitors make an appearance. I would agree to speculate that the, the, the uh, spirit of the last light keeper probably exists here. If somebody does happen to hear something or see something that maybe happens without any rational, immediate explanation, don't rule it out. Many believe that the last keeper, Captain Salty, still keeps a watchful eye over his lighthouse. He's still going up at the light whatever hour he needs to to check on something. He's still checking downstairs, doing you know whatever's involved and keeping that light on and keeping track of, the, of this house, he's doing it. There's he not some, say. the spirit of some disgruntled individual who's, who's hanging out here, who's just waiting to do whatever. He, he very much enjoyed his job. And he sees no, he probably, he may in fact see no reason to stop. He's just keeping track of the light. Captain Stalton. Straight up. He said that, right? He's Captain taking care Stalton. of this place. He's uh, people hear things or they, they see things Perfect. moving. That's who I would attribute it to. Thank you, Stetter. Dawn Perry manages Gull Cottage. She hears few complaints, but sometimes guests offer comments or ask questions like, "What exactly is going on around here?" I hear a lot of our guests comment about they heard door closing and it sounded like the closet door in the guest room or the door to the guest room. Lights coming on after they've turned all the lights off and gone to bed, which I don't doubt that they've heard and seen these things. They're very convincing to me when they describe it. We keep journals available to our guests. Um, here at the cottage for them to write their thoughts and their um, experiences down, not just about the hauntings, but just in general. Captain Salty visited us last night, moving two of the statues and closing doors. You could feel his presence in the air. One sign of Captain Salty's presence is found here. He will sometimes take possession of these hand-carved wooden statues. Peering out to sea from an upstairs window, they seem to have a mind of their own. They do move. I know that. Nobody seems to know when they were placed there or who carved them. I tried to find that out. They'll be looking straight ahead or out toward the ocean. Then when you wake up in the morning, they'll be turned, each one, just the same amount of degrees, and they'll be looking toward shore. Janet Chanel 
herself a descendant of a Prospect Harbor lighthouse keeper, was once a guest here, sharing the cottage with a friend. She said, every time we come, we line the statues back up, just in case somebody has touched them. And she said, uh, they will move. When we wake up in the morning, they will move. And if a spirit that is restless in the universe plays with the figures, that's okay with me. I'm not ruling that out. Most people who have spent the night at Gull Cottage feel a very strong atmosphere in the house. Those people are so attached. They've given their lives to this place. It's what they were. They lived here, they worked here. It was everything. So, you know, perhaps their spirits still do linger here. It may be hard for someone to let go of everything that they knew. And for these people, there weren't, there weren't summer homes and vacations. This was it. They lived and worked and died at the, at the lighthouse. I would like to believe that there are, that there are ghosts that they exist. Sure. It's a very romantic and, and nostalgic idea to think that it's not over when it's over, that you can come back and, and see things and see people. Guests here may always wonder who shares their cottage, who rattles around the bedrooms, and who moves the wooden carvings. If I were a ghost, this is a place I would pick. <laughs> the Atlantic coast of Maine is harsh and lonely. It has few inhabitants, just the kind of place you might expect to find a ghost. But further south, far from the cold water, lobsters and solitude of Maine, we find Florida's panhandle region on the Gulf of Mexico. Pensacola is a busy beach town. It's also the home of the US Navy's precision flight squadron, the Blue Angels, and one of the world's largest aviation museums. Pensacola has a tall, picture-perfect lighthouse. It appears normal in every respect. But in fact, it may be one of America's most haunted lighthouses. It's a real fine line between your imagination playing with you versus what is really happening. If we got a spirit or two spirits here, you know, apparently they're, they're uh, benign. You know, they're not harmful. Nobody's ever been harmed. Pensacola Lighthouse has stood on duty for nearly 150 years shining its beam 40 kilometers out to sea. Although the tower rises over a Navy base, it's managed by the United States Coast Guard, which maintains the building while trying to rebuff persistent rumors that the lighthouse is haunted. Everybody likes to think that, uh, you know, just because it's as old as it is, it's been through as much history as it has, there's, there's, there's bound to be ghosts here. We have lots of people who believe very strongly that it is haunted. We have other people who are less, less believers and more skeptical. Local residents like to tell the story of an incident that took place one hot summer night in the late 1800s. A tragedy that might be long forgotten, but for a grim reminder left behind. All I can do is tell you what my impressions were. And I do know that there was, there was life and death in that room. Apparently it was an argument that uh, occurred between a lighthouse keeper and uh, his wife. She just took a knife to him. And uh, from what I understand, it was a murder. This was probably not the first time he had attacked her. Yes, it was murder, but it was, I would call it self-defense. That's where the stain came from, on the floor. As long as this house is standing, as long as that floor is in there, that, that stain's gonna be there. I know they've tried to uh, scrub it. It always comes back. It comes back in the same spot. There's definitely a, an evil, bad feeling in that particular room. An evil, bad feeling, along with some century-old blood, seem to have permanently stained the mood here as well as the bedroom floor. And it marks the beginning of a series of very strange recent events. There's definitely a presence here that uh, makes me nervous. January in this part of Florida can mean dark nights and freezing temperatures. A few winters ago, when a deep freeze gripped Pensacola, a plumber from the nearby Navy base scouted for frozen pipes. He is not the kind of man given to fanciful imagining, but he is sure 
he has talked with a ghost. I made about four circles around the lighthouse here. And uh, every, every time I'd stop to look for the leak, I could feel so in here somebody walking behind me. I reached down, shut the valve off. I heard something on the front steps by the front door, and I looked up, and I thought it was the other gentleman working with me out here. And I says, Ed, I says, are you done yet? All of a sudden, I noticed it wasn't Ed. When I asked him, was he done yet? His response was, I'll never be done. Folks out there can believe what you want to, <laughs> but uh, I, I've seen the real deal. <laughs> I know that this place has spirits. I can only say that now because it had to happen to me personally in order for me to believe it. It was the second Halloween that we had been conducting haunted lighthouse climbs. And um, I was standing right here in my witch's costume. Before I would start them up these stairs, I would say something like, uh, Mr. Lighthouse Keeper, don't scare these people. Um, they're just here to see the lighthouse and then they're gone. And all of a sudden I feel on the back of my right elbow, I got three distinct taps. And of course I turned to think maybe that somebody was there that needed my assistance, but there was nobody there. So I was touched by the ghost. But you don't need to be touched by a ghost to feel its cold chill. Early one evening, a startled young girl caught the attention of a veteran lighthouse volunteer. She and her family had seen an image of a lady in white up on the second catwalk of the lighthouse. The volunteer explained the lighthouse was locked and empty. But the young girl insisted there was someone on the tower. She seemed to think right away that it was a ghost that they had seen. Finally, when I heard footsteps myself when I was here alone, I became convinced that we really did have ghosts. On yet another night, the beacon unexpectedly went dark. An emergency call summoned the man in charge, accompanied by his wife. Well, that night, the light was reported extinguished. We got the call and we came back. And when we came up to the door, she said we had locked somebody in. It was a man, uh, like an older man's voice, uh, a gruff voice. I said, no, there's nobody locked in there that I know of. The closer we got, the louder it was, yet my husband couldn't hear it. My main goal was just getting the light back on so the mariners could still steer by it. I said, well, there is somebody inside. They are frustrated. I can hear them, and they're not happy. We opened the door. And turned on the light and everything went silent again for her. I walked in and was just chilled, head to toe. I said, no, there's nobody, there's nobody in there. He found nothing, absolutely nothing. Sometimes I'm a Downey Thomas and I've always, I've heard like everybody else that I've heard bumps and I've heard noises, you know, and sometimes maybe uh, things I might have thought were footsteps. Things that just can't be explained. You can't put a finger on it and I have to physically see it in front of me to believe it, but uh, still you just can't shake that feeling sometimes, you know, it's, it's very strange. What I feel at this lighthouse, it's as if somebody's right behind me, but there's nobody there. It's kind of like somebody's whispering, somebody's chattering, but they're not there. <laughs> you know, it might be a touch, it might be a tug on your clothes. Just, there's all these subtle little things, but nothing concrete, you know? Nothing concrete, but if you have a sensitive disposition, you may believe you have felt a ghost. Pensacola is an attractive beach resort with a strong military presence, not the remote, windswept lighthouse setting one would imagine sighting ghosts. But spirits are everywhere, especially when the circumstances surrounding their deaths involve murder. Travel due north from Pensacola, about 2,000 kilometers, and you'll encounter another large body of water, Lake Erie, 
is one of the Great Lakes in the northern central part of the United States, across from Canada. Here you will find the lighthouse at Fairport Harbor, Ohio. These waters can be as rough as the sea, and the need for lighthouses along the Great Lake shores was once considered equally important. It seems that no matter where they were built, there will always be lighthouse stories. I think this building is very old, and there's a lot of history here. If you start thinking back to all of the history and you know the people that lived here and what they did, um, you know, it, that might be a reason why you feel a little bit more of a presence. This is kind of like a castle, like in Europe, you know, an old castle with all the history behind it. We have our lighthouses. One of the ghosts at Fairport Harbor Lighthouse is not what you might expect. Prowling around this light station is one of the most unusual spirits you'll encounter anywhere. Do I believe in ghosts? Well, there are a lot of things that happen that are unexplained at the lighthouse, so it could be. One of the strange things that happened at this lighthouse was the discovery of a body. We were running some plumbing over to, uh, to the air conditioning system, crawled back in about three-fourths of the way in there. It was dark, you know, it was uh, a place that nobody had been for maybe 150 years, so uh, yeah, it was, it was unusually frightening. I noticed something on the left side of my head. I turned just slightly to see what it was, and there staring at me in my face was the face of a cat. It looked to me as if it was there for at least 100 years. It, it, was, it was very old. The teeth were still intact. Its ears were up. Uh, it was indeed a cat. It's a bit, you know, spooky. The discovery of the cat's body was initially a shock, but it made sense of some of the strange noises and sightings around the lighthouse. What's going on here? Here's a mummified cat, and, you know, there's a story of a ghost cat that has circulated for so long, and needless to say, it really scared me. The cat had been haunting the lighthouse for many years, but was there another spirit in the building? Ghosts come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and even species. Fairport Harbor Lighthouse appears to have spirits of every sort. About 20 years ago, the lighthouse took on a new curator. When Pamela Brent moved in, what she didn't know was that part of her job was to live with the unexpected. I moved in with my husband and two sons in 1987 and our basic job was to take care of the grounds and handle tours here at the, at the museum. Nobody else really ever talked about it, so there wasn't like a feeling of there was a ghost here. There wasn't anything preconceived to me that there were going to be ghosts here in any way, shape, or form. I just did not expect it. It was about a year uh, before I actually saw the cat itself just kind of gray and more the tail in the rear end and it just kind of dashed in front of me and I just kind of stopped for a minute that okay maybe it was just something I'd you know I'm tired or something like that. I was coming from the boys room and heading towards the living room coming around the corner and I saw the cat just right about there. Just knowing I didn't have an animal here I was like no I can't be seeing this. Considering the age of the building, there had to have been spirit somehow attached to the building. It looked like it was building. sitting on the steps. Did you see it? And in this case, it was a cat. Poor baby. In its 200-year history, the longest-serving lighthouse keeper at Fairport Harbor Lighthouse was Captain Joseph Babcock. His tenure was plagued by hardship. Just months after he was appointed, Babcock's five-year-old son, Robbie, died in the lighthouse. Then his wife fell ill. While she was bedridden, he gave her several cats. 
and just before she died, her favorite one disappeared, perhaps into the basement. And we think that might have been one of Mrs. Babcock's cats. And we don't know if that was one of the ghosts that has haunted our uh, dwelling for the past, must be 50 years at least. When they did find the mummified cat, it was, it was really quite a surprise, but it was kind of nice for me to realize that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't making this up in my mind that something had really been there. And we finally had physical proof of it too. And if the bizarre cat story isn't ghostly enough for Fairport Harbor, Another presence seems to be lurking in the lighthouse, making itself known in a downstairs hallway. Before the cat, little Robbie Babcock died here as well. The only time I ever had forebodings and feelings was downstairs. The spirit that was downstairs, and he seemed to be very angry, whoever it was. You could feel anger down in the lower northeast corner. It could have been the child, there was a young boy who had died here at the home. He was the son of one of the, the last lighthouse keepers, and he died, we believe, of influenza. Whether they believe in ghosts or not, everyone believes there is a strange atmosphere in this lighthouse. It's a little creepy here at night. It's very quiet. Um, you think of all the history and um, you know, what's around you, the, the lighthouse, and um, you just get this feeling. People have told me that at times when they're in here, they um, have an eerie feeling. Eerie is a word that people use a lot. Right in that hallway right there, it was just this eerie, creepy feeling. I don't even know how to describe what I was feeling. It just was just eerie. When I turned the corner, it was just, it just came all of a sudden. It feels like something passes through you almost. I can't tell you whether it's haunted or not because I have never seen a ghost personally. There are people that say that they have. Many times when I've been in there, I've heard noises and uh, I'm not sure exactly what, what they're from. I really wanted to get out of the lighthouse. I'm very convinced it was a ghost. Definitely it was a ghost. Is this place haunted? You can draw your own conclusions. There you go. There is something about a lighthouse that gives us hope, that gives us comfort. A ray of light across the water the that creep. leads to safe harbors. <laughs> Yet lighthouses are lonely. Absolute creep. And the people who live in them are removed from the comforts of a town. Perhaps their remoteness makes them susceptible to myth. Or just maybe they are the perfect places in America to be a ghost. To be, what do y'all think? Negative 45 of what says all say eerie together. We can do that on the count of three. One, two, three. Eerie. They are eerie. This is eerie. I'll tell you what. Is it a good place to be a ghost? We got That's the water. Good. We had a yeah. We had a lot of good convo in the in the uh, chat about the salt water, Steve. You know why doesn't the salt water repel ghosts? If you if you wash your walls or you clean your home or put salt in the corners, keep it in your pocket. I think it's the intent and what the energy you put into it. What do you think? Intent. And then maybe if, uh, you know, they're, they're trapped there on the lighthouse because they can't cross that salt water. They can't get off the, the island or off the rock. All good maybe. questions. All good theories. All good theories. You know, you know, I, I got, I must say, I think the cat uh, ghost story is the most horrific ghost story I think I've ever heard. You know, it's so sad. So, Echo was asking, am I a cat person? You know, you just think about, you know, when animals go off and, you know, the story, it's it's, it's such a good story. The, the man goes and gets her, the husband goes and gets her cats because she's bedridden. Here's a bunch of cats. What a lovely thing to do. It's better than flowers. I'll tell you that right now. You know, what do you think? And then her favorite one, you know, went off and it's possible. But again, it could be one of those yarns that people just filled in all the blanks and now it's a story and it's a legend and we'll never know. But you love to hear them. 
Can you hear me? You're you're muted. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I there thought you, you were talking to the audience. I didn't know you were no, talking to me. No, I was talking to you. I'm just saying you love to hear them, but you know you don't know for sure if it's one of those legends that kind of spun themselves. You know, because yeah, it, it, what it, better place yeah. for a story like that? It, it, they're good stories. I but there is something creepy about a lighthouse. Now I got to go ahead and give a disclaimer now. There's people in the, the chat saying they're going to go watch that movie, The the Lighthouse, with uh, Willem Dafoe. I got to tell you ahead of time, if, if you're like an American Horror Story fan, you know, a kind of a, you know, think Poe meets Pinhead. You know what I mean? And, and it's so dark and, you know, dismal, and it really does drain you. You can feel it, it and it's meant to. You know, but just know that going in because, you know, it's hard to come back out of some stuff like that. You know, we can all think about movies that we saw that we didn't realize were going to have such an impact on us when we saw it. And I think it's a good time since it just passed. And, and I'm going to yield to Steve to take us out with the story on it. And I think it's apropos to talk about because we just had the anniversary of the Titanic. And, um, you know, we all know the story. Now, if you're going to hear about the Titanic from Cisco, you're going to hear about the bankers that weren't on the Titanic. <laughs> you're going to hear about how JP Morgan's luggage was on the Titanic, but he changed his mind at the very end, you know, and on April 12th, um, it, she went down and uh, only bankers that were going to vote against the uh, federal reserve, which is not, neither federal or reserve uh, were on it. So there's a story there. And um, here's a little tidbit for you. If you like numbers and you believe in, you know, how numbers have powers, and especially if you put spells with them, that uh, think about it. Titanic went down on the 12th. They uh, met on a, a little island that's uh, named after, sounds like Jackal, but it's not, <laughs> but it's not, it's close. And what day do you pay your taxes? Because mm -hmm. that's the day it was signed. Yep. And Woodrow Wilson was way up in that. So here's Steve's nicer version <laughs> of the Titanic stuff. Tell him, tell him what happened with us with uh, with the Titanic. We're talking yeah, about we were, the orbs and everything. Go ahead. Yeah, we were talking about uh, what we were going to talk about and. Uh, Cisco got the idea while she was taking a shower. I think she said, let's talk about the Titanic tonight. So yeah. we did. And um, we were talking about some of these places that have Titanic exhibits. There's uh, one in Las Vegas, and I've, I've been to that one. Yes. And yes. then there's one in uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, <clears throat> which I've, mm -hmm. I've never had the pleasure to visit. It wasn't there when I lived in East Tennessee. But that night when we were talking about those, at the very moment, and we verified this with the 911 dispatch transcript, the very yes. moment we mentioned the one in uh, Pigeon Forge, they had a, an iceberg wall there. It was actual frozen water with, a, I don't know, something run through the pipes to refrigerate it. But it collapsed and sent, like, what was it, five people to the hospital or something the very second. The very we mentioned that one. So, I, I don't so know. I mean, I so take close. Any responsibility, we had it down to a minute, the, the minute, the, yeah. you know, within three minutes of us talking about it because we actually went back. It was so creepy because I'm in the shower that morning and I had to get out of the shower. You know, when you get a phone call, or you get that thing, you have to get up, shut off an alarm or something, and you're, uh, you know, you throw down a towel and you know that you're going to get the floor wet, whatever. It was one of those where I just had to grab the phone and get it out of my head and tell Steve. It's like, tell Steve we're doing the Titanic. It was that kind of a thing. And he's like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, crazy, right? And it was, uh, it was an, an exhibit, a huge, uh, like a half an iceberg or something, wasn't it? I've yeah, never it was, seen. Uh, like, like tons, I think, and. Uh, I don't know how they had Peace it, fell off, up, whatever. But, uh, had nitrogen run through pipes or something to freeze it, but I guess it got too warm in there and uh, a big chunk of it broke off and collapsed and, and hit. It, it didn't people. kill anybody, thank goodness, but it, it did send people to the hospital.
And that sent us in a whirlwind spin that, you know, it seemed like every time we talked about somebody, like we talked about a band and we talk about individuals and then that person yeah, next day go. or the middle of the night, they would pass. Yeah, we talked we about like, uh, Meatloaf and his uh, connection gone the next to day. the JFK. I couldn't believe it. And then he was gone. It's like, yep. mm. And for a while there, we were sending stuff. that way, Yoko um, Ono. But uh, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't always work, Yoko Ono. Nope. Not when you do it on purpose, and I think that's that and, that and has a message in about it. the monkeys and then it has to be them passed. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't yeah. Remember which one it was. I mean, if we, if we were on a roll for a while. It's just like we didn't mean it, but we didn't mean it. When you focus on something, it seems like it. You know, there, there might be something to that. See, I don't know. There's something to all of this. There's something to this dude, dude seeing this. In the, I wonder if I can find that picture and show you. The the Bigfoot in the glasses in the in the camera, you know, again. So it would have to be how many lenses is that? And again, we might not even be talking about lenses. We might be just talking about reflective surfaces, like okay. looking into a well. Um, you know, how many stories, you know, where you you look into the water and you see prophecy, you see it, it, the bowl well, of water. Like scrying, yeah, the the, the 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 black bowl and the or they may come out of a highly polished piece of uh, stone or a, obsidian, a, a crystal ball. That's a form right, of right. Spraying. Yep, absolutely. And you know the glasses, the glasses with you know the this. Um, I got to find his YouTube channel, but uh, his. Uh, here we go. Let me see if I can find a picture of this for you. All right, here's a good one right there. Look at that. The glasses in, um, shoot, it's not working there. The glasses, I'm sharing the wrong doggone. Doggone it. You knew I had to hit a wrong button eventually. All right, let's try this again. The, the glasses in 13 Ghosts, the glasses in They Live. Um, Rowdy Roddy Piper. You know I love Rowdy. He's always yeah. been my favorite. Always been my favorite. He has an excellent, excellent, excellent um, backstory and ghost story and uh, experience. Um, it tells an awful lot about yeah, the other side. You played that one night, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Still, um, let me tell you, Savalas. His is my favorite. But yeah, I he's digress. my favorite. Yep, yep. You know. Well, and there's, you know, Steve, there's so many good ones. There's so many good ones. All right. This one might be. Yep. I think I got it now. There we go. Can you see it now? There we go. This is the movie we're talking about. They live. This was glasses too. And when he put Rowdy puts on, it's kind of like a, I would almost say it's like a, pro, a, pro, a prophetic, but it's, um, he puts on the glasses and he can see. That behind, you know, on billboards, it wasn't it like obey and yeah, like the subliminal type stuff that people would would listen to it and didn't know work. why, but he could see with those glasses, right. he could see the true nature and intent of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was people that appeared to be human, but were really something else underneath. Now I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but they're actually putting out um, something called. Let me see if I can get out of this now. Um, and I'm not making this up, but it's definitely supernatural, paranormal, propaganda, conspiracy, true crime, all wrapped up into one. And tell me if you've heard it. Um, demon base virus, something like that. Demon. So what they're trying to say is that if you are starting to see things where people aren't you're like you're looking at somebody and all of a sudden you kind of see their true self and it might not be look very human it might look more demonic or might look more um alienish or something else just kind of very much like they live it's insane and they're saying it's okay it's it's not them it's you you have a virus it's bad and you have it and it you're you're going it's just it you're not seeing it it's you. You have a virus. I am not making this up. It's been in certain headlines over the past two weeks. Just Google it. Um, duck, duck, go it. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, it's like that, Jack. But but more so, it's 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 
they're saying you see it. what the heck is it called steve have you heard this steve uh i've heard briefly about it. it's an actual syndrome there you go it's a rare disorder that people can have but now supposedly there's a virus that's given it to people so i mean zombies you know what's next we got locusts we got murder hornets what what else just it's like at this point steve it's like you know superman with the bullets just ricocheted off and i'm like sure it nope no problem believing what well, they didn't show the bullets ricocheted off superman but then they got all these they hit somebody else <laughs> It's somebody else. I'm sorry, guys, if you get hit with one of my bullets, but I'm just not absorbing this this crap anymore. I'm just, you know, head down, uh, just keeping the lights on, and you know, trying to sort my my true crime and my my other stuff. Get my Rumble channel sorted out. Uh, you know, stuff that editing. You know, looking for for cool ideas and and stories for you guys. You know, uh, and you never get tired of a good ghost story. We saw so many good ones tonight and last night, too. Um, last night, we were watching uh, Extraordinary Ghost, Steve. There was a story of a guy. It kind of goes with Lighthouse, so I'm going to tell Steve this because he didn't get to see it last night. But the guy goes down. Um, he's diving. So he's a w underwater welder, something along these lines. He goes down, and while he's down, there's only one boat, the one he just got off of. That's out in the middle of, you know, as far as you're, there I can see. And he goes down. And while he's down there, he's fixing something, doing what he's going down there to do. And he looks up and there's another diver. And he's in like older, you know, with the bubble kind of thing with the weights in the, in, in the boots and all that kind of thing. He's there. He sees him. They have an interaction. There was another guy who saw it, saw something. But, you know, he didn't want to talk about it. And uh, the guy comes up, and the first thing he says when he hits the boat is, I saw a ghost down there. And um, it just seemed like extra I, I don't know if it's extra creepy, you know, because it's underwater. But um, not one you hear often. You know, it kind of reminded me a little like Pir Pirates of the Caribbean, where all the pirates were, like, walking underwater. And you remember that scene where mm -hmm. all the pirates are walking, and, you know. You never get tired of this mess, man. So what do you got going on this week, my friend? Uh, more videos. So uh, much. Persons and mysteries. And then I've got uh, some changes coming up on uh, Among the Missing. I'm going to rebrand that channel. And I think everybody's going to like what I'm going to do over there. All the missing. You're always doing uh, something exciting. Videos will be over on Missing Persons Mysteries. And then doing something entirely different with Among the Missing. But it'll, right. it'll be, you'll enjoy it. It'll be fun. That's great. I'm glad that you're, I see that you're constantly busy doing so many things now. Name name off a couple of the other ones we don't get to hear a lot about. Tell me a little bit about the radio show, too. Oh, yeah. That's uh, everything out there on the Clyde Lewis Ground Zero radio network. Had some amazing stellar guests over there. Cisco's been on there several Has Mark times. been on yet? Uh, no, we're, we're working that out. But uh, Mark Anthony Wyatt's going to join me. Yep. Um, who else He's in I here tonight. Uh, Michael Acciano is going to be on there. Yes, I spoke um, to him today. I He's coming Drew, soon. Drew Beeson on there the other night. Author, it's written there about the uh, Zodiac uh, Killer, and uh, he, he was on. Uh, last week I had Kay Love, a girl that went up and lived on Mount Shasta for five months and had all kinds of experiences. It's great. Check it out. It airs on Sunday nights from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern on the uh, Ground Zero Radio Network. There you go. Here it is. Here it is. I knew some one of our great mods would throw it up here. And thanks again to all the mods that come in here and, you know, you put up with my button pushing and, you know, the, the hot mess express over here. But you're always very kind to everybody, new people that come in. Um, and, you know, you keep the chat going and you keep them, you know, you. You might have conversations on the side, but you always bring people back to the topic and and things like that. Keep everybody grand. It's just a wonderful, um, I don't know what you call it, coordinated dance kind of, uh, uh, Steve, I think. You know, it's, 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 it's the best cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's just the way we like it. You know, haunted is all get out, right? You know, so and and uh, Mark says he's looking forward to it, Steve. So yeah, Mark, I got your there. email. I just haven't uh, taken time to uh, 
respond back to you. He wrote me like a novel, and I've got to respond back, tell him it'll make sense, Mark, when I tell you everything that's going on in the uh, house of Stockton. You'll get yep. it. And around the campfire. And you also have the one, um, the UFO. With, from beyond. Uh, That'll be on Wednesday well, night with Lee G. Cathedral drop a link there, please, I hope. And um, and what time does that come on? Comes on 6 p.m. Wednesday nights Eastern time. From beyond, as Lee so says. He, he, he does it with it. Eight, six to six, eight. Six to seven, eight, somewhere around in there. We run usually run about an hour. Uh, we've been digging up some old uh, documentaries about UFOs and related phenomena from the sixties and seventies and, and back. Uh, we've been we've covered um, Bob Lazar. There's a lot of information back Philip then. Schneider, uh, touch often on Roswell. They're still finding out stuff about Roswell. Right. Have we ever dug up the one that uh, the documentary that Jim Mars did? You and I talked about it a little bit. It was a, a little town. Um, I want to say New Mexico. May have been New Mexico, Texas. Might have been Texas. Right in there. I, I'll have to look into it. I don't want to give wrong information. But anyhow, the whole point of it was is there was another crash, uh, supposedly with bodies. And it was the one where the town kind of hushed everything up and buried them and gave them a Christian burial. And uh, Jim Mars did a, a documentary on it. it. Should be easy to look up. I'll figure it out. But uh, then, th when people started talking about, it, they moved the bodies. Somebody in the yeah, night. I, I know the one. Do you remember you know what I'm talking about now? Yeah. It's kind of like a Roswell thing, but no, you know, uh, not heard of as much, and very, very strong armed on on shutting it off, uh, shutting it all down. It goes hand in hand with that other one where another small town. Uh, many of people saw it coming back and forth to work from the ice cream, social, whatever the heck they were doing. And uh, all the town saw it. The The sheriff's office was getting inundated with calls. And, you know, I'm sure they still had that operator with all the little wires and stuff. It was that kind of town. Yeah. It was back early, late 40s, early 50s, where they had that, where they used to have the radio station, Steve, where you could walk by and see the DJ inside because he's behind the glass. They wanted it that way, and he was spinning records, you know? Yeah. And he went in to talk about it, and a car ca pulls up out of nowhere. He said he never saw the car before, and two guys came in. It came up to him, really intimidating energy. He felt it, you know, it was, it, it was palpable. And they took all his tape and said, did you record anything? You know, you're not going to talk about this on the radio and just shut him down completely. And he didn't know what to do. He was like, uh, you, like they used the Vulcan mind melt on him or something. Do you know, you know about that one? We had to do a show on all this, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff, you know, if, if you're pulling stuff from the seventies, sixties and seventies, all of that stuff was so um, information filled those documentaries and those newsreels and the films and, and uh, stuff they did, they were golden. I mean, think, you know, we're going back to uh, the times of uh, we've seen them here on the show with uh, like the, the legend of Boggy Creek kind of stuff where, you know, yeah, and people are sitting great, around great old documentaries. Yeah. And they're talking about and Bermuda triangle and you're getting the truth and stuff now is so watered down and so infiltrated with nonsense that, you know, you have to filter it so much just to get a fact. Where if you go back, uh, a lot of stuff slipped through, good stuff and bad. You know, we've talked about the stuff they slipped in with uh, Anton LaVey and and uh, Crowley and all them and inside of a, a lot of that. Say, there was a reason to have a satanic panic, if you ask me, in the 70s, because some of that stuff they were chanting. Yeah. It had some meat on a bone. <laughs> so there you go, guys. Lighthouses haunted. I think they're creepy. Um, I think they're beautiful from afar. I wouldn't want to live in one, and I couldn't do the stairs. As much as I like them, I couldn't do the stairs. So how about you, Steve? Yeah, I wouldn't want to climb those stairs uh, every time Amazon delivers something. Oh, that's, gotta go, gotta yeah. Go, gotta go, gotta go. Well, it's a lugging your groceries. Well, you don't, you know, you don't live up there where the light is, but yeah, you have to go it's up a, there and check those lenses. And if the bulb goes out and this that, and the other, you you would have man, to the stairs again. It was a hard job. It was a hard job, and have whole families. And we saw with the, the lighthouses too. If you think about it, 
when you, I don't know what you think when you hear Lighthouse, you, you know, of course, ones you've seen and ones that they make, you know, prominent, you know, you almost always think of them being on an island, like I said in the beginning, or, you know, right up shore. But some of these are absolutely gorgeous. And like Ted was saying, like almost got mansions next to them. And some of them are just little dinky, you know, they stick them out there with hardly anything. It's like, this is all we can afford. You have to go out there and we'll see you in a year. You know, you have some hard tack and, you know, no, and, and a bowl or something, <laughs> you know, I don't, it, it's just so weird how time but it, changes it so much. The whole idea of the lighthouse and spooky and everything gave me an idea for something I'm going to do coming up. So, oh, wow. That's so cool. Ripples. That's wonderful. And Michael, like I said, I wanted to tell you all, Michael Lachian is coming. He's, he's got a lot of good stuff um, in the works. He's been busy over there. Uh, he's got the Amazon Prime. He's got uh, Journey to uh, to the Past, you know, and uh, it's it's amazing the way he does it. He focuses on the the history and the town and the people there that have seen things, and he spends a long time there. Him and his crew. He doesn't just go and leave. So um, he's gonna have a lot of interesting things, folks, and that's coming up soon. So we'll get back to you. Listen. Get out there, survive as best you can, keep your lights up. <laughs> don't buy it, don't buy the bullshit, and you know, don't don't take any wooden nickels, right, Steve? Yep. I Absolutely. love you, my friend. Hi, Nick. Absolutely. We love you too, baby. We love you. <laughs> All right, listen. And if you can't get rid of the blues, dance it away. I love y'all. Good night, everybody. Good Thanks night, for everybody. stopping in. Hit the like on the way out for, for an old broad, will you? Thank you. Good night. Good night, baby. Love you. Love y'all, too. Be good. Be good humans. Be good humans. We need every single one of them we can get. Hang in there. You got this. See you this week. We put up a mystery. See you in the chat. Good night, everybody. <laughs>